you know? Can you explain what America will look like if an EMP hits? What, what happens to America? It literally is the, an apocalypse, an electronic apocalypse. Uh, if we're talking about a nuclear EMP attack, and we're, this is the, a single nuclear weapon detonating over the center of the country, uh, it takes down not just the electric grid, but all the other critical infrastructures also depend upon, upon uh, electricity as well and have electronics in them. Business and finance, manufacturing, communications, transportation, uh, food and water. Well, let me start and put it in more concrete terms. You know, Bill Fortune's phrase, one second after. Yeah. You know, one second after a nuclear EMP detonation over this country, you know, there's about a half a million people traveling in airliners in the, over the skies of America as we speak every day, every moment, half a million people in over a thousand airliners. If we're talking about a super EMP weapon, most or all of those are going to come crashing down out of the sky. Uh, the electric grid would immediately stop so there'd be no food and running water. And it's not just like a normal, drought, especially in the case of a protracted grid, because there are these things called SCADAs, Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition Systems, that regulate everything. It regulates the way water flows through a pipe, the way natural gas flows through a pipe, uh, the way oil flows through a pipe. And these SCADAs will spark, they'll spark natural gas explosions. Everywhere there are natural gas pipelines, oh you know, you can expect massive explosions. There's huge concentrations of natural gas pipelines in cities, wow. you know, that would probably cause firestorms in cities. Uh, because the uh, EMP is coupling into the big high power lines, they'll follow those lines because there's nothing to stop the EMP from going right into your house. With a super EMP uh, weapon, you know, it, it can cause the wiring inside of a house to flash so you can have, have houses burned down, or electrical fires started within homes, oh you know, because they haven't protected the big grid. <laughs> the big grid is basically an entryway into every individual's home, you know, for the EMP to come and destroy your house and put it on fire and put your family at risk. Uh, and that's the um, uh, cars won't start, you know, uh, you know, they would be paralyzed. Trains and automobiles, the kinds of equipment that we have at, on, uh, on docks, uh, you know, won't operate so that you can't offload the goods and services that are coming into um, America. Communication systems wouldn't work. Uh, one of the EMP commissioners, a guy named Lowell Wood, compared it to putting the whole country into a giant time machine and sending us back to the pre-electronic age, uh, back to the 19th century, before there was an electric grid. Mm -hmm. And he was correctly challenged by that, by a smart guy who also advised the EMP commission called Fritz Ermark who used to be the chairman of the National Intelligence Council. You know, when Fritz said, uh, no, Lowell, you're wrong. That's a brave thing to do, because Lowell Wood is like one of the most brilliant scientists in America, and he doesn't like to be told he's wrong. But, but Fritz argued that it would be even worse than that. You know, because the, uh, the thing is that in the 19th century America, you know, most of the people were still farmers. 75% of the population lived on farms, Everybody was one generation removed from pioneer stock. So everybody was then what today we would call a survivalist mm -hmm. and would know how to hunt and fish and live off the land. Uh, we had uh, a different if infrastructure in the nation in those days. We had coal-operated railway lines and, uh, and uh, horse-drawn wagons that would bring food to market, things of that sort, you know, pairs of horses to do the work. None of that infrastructure exists today, you know. Uh, what we do have today is what it would be more accurately like is taking a 21st century society and transporting all those people back to the 19th century and then asking them to survive yeah. in an environment that wouldn't be pristine anymore. You know, because the other advantage you had in the 19th century is they didn't have nuclear reactors that had, had, that had gone Fukushima. Those nuclear reactors, what happens in, uh, after seven days, just like at Fukushima, the batteries run out. When, uh, in, in an emergency circumstance, what they first start with is the uh, 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 gas-driven emergency generators because they've got to keep the cooling pumps running inside of the nuclear reactors, you see. And uh, you, you run out of gas in about three days. Uh, then they go to batteries as the, as, the, as the last backup. 
and as we learned at Fukushima, you know, those will fail in a few days. So overall, you've got about a week of electri emergency electrical generating power to get the big grid back online to save the nuclear reactors. If the re blackout lasts more than a week, the reactors start going Fukushima. And that's not just a problem for the local area. Just like in Japan, which fortunately for them, they're an island, you know, most of the radioactivity got blown out over the Pacific Ocean. But we're not a big island. We're not an island. The, most, of the most of these reactors are located in the eastern half of the United States, co-located with our population centers. You know, the winds and the weather patterns will pick up the radioactivity and it will carry it over the whole country. So you have a hundred and some odd uh, Fukushima's causing radioactive contamination of very dangerous levels that will make recovery and survival much more difficult. And that's just one of the environmental problems. <laughs> Other more common, you know, one of the things they didn't have in the 19th century that we have today, I mean, they had pure rivers and, and lakes. We don't today, even, right. even with all of our efforts. You take your life in your hands if you go to a river or a lake and mm. drink out of it, mm -hmm. all right? And we, we are doing our best to try to clean these up, uh, you know, because we have vast and very expensive uh, uh, hydro treatment facilities to purify the water, purify sewage, purify industrial and hospital waste, wastes, uh, uh, you know, to clean that up. And all of this is run by vast amounts of electricity. Uh, you know, and when the grid goes down, what we know from even normal temporary blackouts is, is, is the waste materials back up into the lakes and rivers and streams. You know, we had a situation like this happen in Maryland. And so the dangerous bodies of water that are dangerous to drink from on a normal basis become fatally dangerous, you know, in the aftermath of an EMP because of the, uh, because of these, the spread of these pollutants. And we, so those are just some of the examples. Think of uh, any... You know, our, our industrial society is like a gigantic chemistry set. You know, the gasoline that's produced in this country. I don't know if you've ever been to Texas mm -hmm. and gone and looked at those big, uh, you know, uh, installations that create our oil and our gasoline and our propane. You know, they're like enormous chemistry sets. Mm -hmm. And they are just waiting for a SCADA to spark and, set, and, and cause the thing to explode, mm -hmm. you know. There are industrial facilities and are all, and associated with all of our major population centers like that. And uh, you'd end up with toxic clouds going in, uh, uh, you know, poisonous fires uh, that would basically turn. So that's why Fritz Ermarth said that Lowell Wood was wrong because, you know, it wouldn't be like going back to the 19th century where we would get a chance to be like the Indians again and maybe learn how to live off the land. You know, the land we'd have to live off would be contaminated by radio radiation, you know, you'd have cities and uh, areas that had been burned down, forest fires from natural, uh, natural gas. Uh, you know, basically a, a chemical and radiological hell, uh, you know, that would be the consequence of the, uh, of the EMP turning down the grid and causing industrial accidents, wide-scale industrial accidents across, across the entire country. And we calculated... Now, most people wouldn't die on our calculations from poison or from the radioactivity. I mean, those things could certainly kill tens of millions of people. But even if those things weren't happening, you know, the f most fundamental uh, threat is, is the absence of food and water. Right. You know, uh, we only have enough food to feed 210 million Americans uh, for about 30 days. Uh, it's in the big regional food warehouses. Uh, these are also privately owned. They're not owned by the government. And, uh, you know, we have big re regional food warehouses that resupply the local grocery stores. Your local grocery store has about two to three day food supply on a normal basis. In Washington, when, there's, when they expect a blizzard coming in, yeah. I mean, you can see the folly of that because the, the grocery store shelves get completely stripped from people hoarding the food. That's right. And uh, it's only enough for two to three days. It has to be resupplied. Well, how do you resupply that food when the, the trucks that carry it? don't work because the EMP has, has destroyed them and transportation systems don't work. And that food will begin to spoil in three days because their emergency electricity supply is only enough for about three days. And then the food begins to spoil because the food is kept consumable, you know, by refrigerators and temperature control systems and uh, all the complex technology we have. It's the absence of food and water that would, uh, you know, that would kill most people. I guess uh, kind of summing it up, as the EMP Commission report did, you know, an EMP, uh, you know, basically would transform, it would create, recreate in this country 
the kinds of conditions that we uh, see in third world countries that experience famines. You know, uh, suddenly there's no food and water and no way to get it to people. Even if our allies, for example, uh, wanted to try rescuing us. I often hear, well, gee, won't the Australians and the Brits come to our rescue and start shipping food to the United States? Well, you know, Australia is a food exporter. Mm -hmm. Britain is a food importer. Mm -hmm. and, but even if you could, even if the Chinese and the Russians decided to take mercy on us <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, the, and, and, and try to bring their navies to bring food to the United States, mm -hmm. you know, we couldn't get the food off the docks, you know, because it reply, relies on high technology cranes and uh, distribution systems and trucks to, re, uh, to distribute it. And that's exactly the problem that we've had, for example, during the Somalia and Ethiopian famines. Mm -hmm. You know, the United Nations was bringing enough food to feed everybody in Ethiopia and Somalia to the docks. But there was no way to move it off the docks and into the hinterlands because they didn't have a, a critical infrastructure that was developed enough to get it to where it was needed. And that same condition would come to exist in the United States in the aftermath of an EMP. So starvation, in the end, is the would be the biggest killer of all. Starvation, including the lack of water. You know, people need water even more than food. Right. And, uh, and uh, immediately, it, uh, you know, unless you're on a well, you know, with, uh, you know, uh, 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 everybody who lives in a city, you know, d depends up upon uh, water that's purified and pumped through mm -hmm. electrical pumps. And mm -hmm. immediately you would have, uh, have no water. Right. We will be right back after this special message.